But what I'm going to be looking at today is how, or one aspect on how we are all individually different. And I'm going to base it on a book by a couple um, of researchers called Alan and Barbara Pease, who are academics from Australia. And they wrote a book which only a married couple, or a living together couple, could actually write. It's called, Why Men Don't Listen, <laughs> yep, exactly, and Why Women Can't Read Maps. Now, what they're doing in this is not to point out all women can't read maps or all men don't listen. What they are providing for you is an understanding of how men and women, women differ at the great poles. The ultra male, the ultra female. The importance of what they're writing about, what I shall cover this afternoon, is that none of us, or almost none of us, live out there. On the ten chapters or so in the book, we will all live somewhere in a different position along that huge continuum from ultra male to ultra female. And what is important from today is not necessarily whether I'm over there or over there, but it's to understand the consequences of where we actually are. And I'll give you a test which will help you to position yourself along the spectrum, but that's not where we stop. You then need, we all need to then think about, okay, so if I'm there or there or there, what does that do to the way I am perceived by those around me, male and female, or those in the middle? And how should I understand how other people are communicating with me? How do I understand where they are coming from? You remember last week or the week before I was saying about presentation? Yeah, last week. That politician who said, oh, the electorate didn't get my point, and I said no, the position was you, as a politician, a communicator, should understand your audience. In the same way, if we understand those around us and where we are, we will be more effective in our personal and our business relationships, and I want to concentrate on our business relationships, your personal relationships with your friends, your families, are your um, not, I won't say problem, but they're the thing that's important for you in your family life, your uh, friend's life. But I want you to be thinking about where you will be going through your academic career here and then into your business career. And where we fit or sit on the continuum, male to female, that we're going to cover today is actually quite significant in many, many areas in terms of career choice, in career terms of even subject choice. So, let's get on with it, folks. And we'll have to go pretty fast, because there's quite a lot to cover here. <clears throat> now, what they point out, first of all, is there are some incredible stereotypes. Men don't listen, women can't read maps, and yet we know there are men who do listen, we know there are women who can read maps and are very good at it. So, we're not looking at really those other than to understand the consequences at the far ends, the polarities. The important point is that spread outness, the, the spectrum. And in many areas in academia, in study, we talk about the polarities of management style. But very few companies ever live at that point or that point. They live somewhere in the middle. But understanding those two points helps us to understand if I've got 20% of that and 80% of that, then that affects how, as an organisation, our management style might be different from there or there. Or from another company with a management style over here, on the 20 <coughs> and 80 20 position, perhaps. Joan Rivers, we all know of her. <coughs> Which is more valuable, diamonds or a dog in pound notes? But 
think about it differently from a male perspective, what do we think, guys? Friendship, perhaps, is more important than sparkles. But that shows that we're a bit different, or some of us are different. Okay, setting the scene, that was. Now, into some rather interesting stuff, more relevant. Which of A, B, C, or D could be unfolded to give the first thing on the there? Who says A? Who says B? Who says C? D? <coughs> well, A happens to be right. <coughs> and you can see that by where, which uh, apex the arrow points at. A bit more complicated. Who says A? B? C? Wisdom of the crowds, D. So, some of us are very good and can unwrap those cubes quickly. Some of us can't. It's not a criticism, it's what we are, how we are innately built. Now this one is a little bit longer, a bit more complex. And this comes from the British air traffic controller's sort of aptitude test before, as you apply to become a trainee air traffic controller. Because what they're trying to do is to understand how quickly you build that 3D model in your head of where all those aircraft are that you're trying to control. And you need to do it incredibly quickly. So this is a sort of test that they will be giving you. Line one, A. Line, uh, line 1B, line 1C, line 1D, line 2, you can do them later on, I don't want to spend too much time, it'll take a lot of time, but do you begin to see what's going on with that test? How is forcing you to think about that 3D model and then opening it out and trying to work out the logic. Now, people like me, well, I can just about do it because I unwrap it and I look at the difference and then kind of put it back together again. It takes time. Those who are innately good <coughs> at that 3D perspect uh, perspective and representation can unwrap that in seconds. And so that the fact that someone can do it very, all four rows very quickly shows that they will probably be at least capable of starting an air traffic control type of course. So we can see here there are what, 120, 150 people here. Some get it very quickly, some can get there, and to some it's good. What's almost at the level of what's the point? Why should I make my brain hurt trying to do that? A spectrum. From very, very quick, very capable, to, okay, I can just about get there, to, I can't even begin to get there, and so what? And the consequence is quite interesting. Not as a, you must be dumb not to be able to do it, because that's the wrong approach. Because that's not how we're wired. The point is, as a career choice, if you can do that in seconds on each of those rows and get it right, you've got a career opening up for you. In the middle, you might be able to do it, but it might be a pretty, pretty big struggle. 
On the other, don't even think about applying. It's not going to be worth the effort because it will be a wasted interview. Now, have a look at that. It comes from a few years ago. It may have changed a little bit, but it makes a point. And what's important is to look at the types of subject and whether or not spatial perception is important in some of those. And look for the ones where there are larger um, differences. And we'll look at the next page as well, but it's kind of interesting. And the difference between this page and the last page basically is an incredible polarity. Far, far more men doing these types of subjects than women. On the last page, the difference was almost trivial. Now, two or three percent. Male, female, female, male. In all of those, spatial perception is irrelevant, whereas here, aspects of understanding shapes in space is a bit more important. So, career choices then that may be coming from that sort of <coughs> different approach. What's going on? Is it just what I said? I mean, I talked to some, one of my daughters who had a fairly fit, uh, strong view on this and says it's all to do with um, role models while kids are young. Possibly, possibly not. Who knows? However, one of the very interesting things is in motor racing. And whether kids are growing, starting off in karting or wherever, and whether or not there are opportunities and so on. What we do notice is that in Formula One, over the last 50, 60 years, there have been remarkably few successful women in Formula One. And Susie Vol Wolf, who was the most recent one for um, <coughs> Williams, she only got as far as their test driver. And now she's doing other things. However, <clears throat> oh, here's a, a rather fun bit as well. Help, we're lost, but our dad won't stop for, uh, to ask for advice. Now, before we go, uh, the point here is we do have, as men, generally, there's a stereotype which is a sort of a global perspective, which is inaccurate for most people, but is related to the general population. A lot of us, a lot of us folks, don't like admitting we're lost. We will drive around a bit more and hope we see a landmark which we re uh, recognise. But what we are, on average, able to do is to create a pretty good 3D map from the 2D map that we have. I use Google Earth images, the, you know, the, the photo overlay of mapping to be able to do, to work out where I am and where I'm going to. Because I can look at that overhead picture, the satellite photos or the aircraft photos, and I can turn that into an understanding of, yeah, that's the building I saw. To some extent, to a lesser or greater extent, we can take verbal directions and turn them into our map in our head. Now, before I go back, I go on to the next one, there's one other thing I want to say about that motor racing. That was Formula One, driving around um, complicated sort of circuits. It also applies very much in terms of touring and all sorts of racing where you have to think about everybody around you. However, if you look at the USA, the top fuel racers, who have those 8,000 horsepower uh, top fuel dragsters, point and go, 
you've got a quarter of a mile standing start to get to 305, 310, 315 mph. Over the last 10 years, some of the most, or the, the champions, have been women drivers. Different skill set to drive a Formula One dragster, uh, sorry, a top fuel dragster from a Formula One car or touring cars. You just need to be able to control it down that lane, perfectly straight, with a technical capability and skill to ha manage all sorts of odd problems that top fuel dragsters have as they start, and so on. But you don't have to worry particularly about what's on around you. Different skill set, totally different type of problem to solve. And as I say, some of the very, very, very best, and for several years, the top fuel uh, dragster champion was female. So it's not driving per se that was the problem, or was the difference. So let's have a look now as we go into the, this understanding these differences. The nice thing about the, each chapter in the book is there's a lovely cartoon like this. And I'll show you the cartoon for several of the chapters. And you can read that. A whole lot of uh, geese trying to navigate, and they say, oh no, I can't believe this, girls. Look at this map. I think we're supposed to turn right at that big green mountain. <clears throat> And so we're now looking at some other aspects of spatial perception. How we use maps. And it turns out <coughs> that there is a fundamental difference between the average female over there and the average male over there. But with many males and females, or most males and females, somewhere in the middle. <coughs> now the consequence of this sort of thing is all about how we do things and how we interact with those around us. And to recognize that someone who does turn the map round to face in the right direction. So whereas a lot of people just, okay, all maps in the here in the northern hemisphere have north at the top. And a lot of people can cope with Here's the map, but I'm driving south, so I kind of mentally invert it and say, oh yeah, I'm driving towards me. That's the way many of us work. But people who turn it around, that's the way they work. And how many of you got sat-navs that you have in your car? <coughs> Not very many. Oh well. But those of you who have, do have a sat-nav, how many of you got it set to north at the top as opposed to the direction of travel at the top. North at the top, direction of travel at the top. You're a fighter pilot. Because if you're a fighter pilot, you haven't got time to do the mental gymnastics to turn the map around. You just need to know, I'm going that way, and yes, there's a, ste a steeple over there that says I'm there. How many men, oh, we did that, how many men turned it up? way up, yeah. And this turns out for many people on the more female side of capability and thinking style to be the way that they can understand where things are better than the standard <coughs> ordinary little picture of lines on the map. <coughs> now what all of this was based upon was a whole series of brain scans of lots and lots of people of MRI scanning during the 1990s to see which parts of the brain were firing up to do things. We've seen that in various sort of places. From one point of view, depending which side you're on, it's a ouch sort of feeling. Yes, it is a little bit sort of close to the bone. No science to that at all. It's just sort of observation like people, like sort of um, comedians like uh, Jasper Carrot uh, used to use when he was at the peak of his uh, viewing. He would see lots of things that people did and think, ah, yeah. 
I can make a joke of that, but it's based on real observation. If you think about every single one of those points up there, we've seen someone with one or other of those characteristics. So there's some truth and a lot of joke. The aim is to get people to think. And this is my objective today, is to get you all to think about yourself in relation to others. We see all of that about left hemisphere, right hemisphere. Some of it is kind of based on observation. Some of it's based on a little bit of science, but not much, it turns out. So it makes a little point about something else as well. Common knowledge is kind of not necessary. A lot of people may know it, but it may not be accurate. But there are, again, elements there. And we know from the way the brain works that vision is mediated in most people out of the right hemisphere. And that words and such like tend to be in the left-hand side. But what are the consequences of even believing this common knowledge? First question is why are we believing it? Why do we believe it? Is it just because we've seen it and heard it so many times? We've seen it written down. But does having it written down make it true? Does hearing it time and time again make it true? Maybe. We should think very carefully about everything we read and hear and see that's accepted wisdom, common knowledge, and challenge it. So let's see now what the pictures really show us. <coughs> and again, this is challenged by some academics. So it may not be completely trustworthy, <coughs> but to me it gives us some interesting questions to think about. And what this MRI is doing is showing which parts of the brain are using oxygen during these activities. So we can see on the right, the male brain is using a lot more oxygen in larger parts of the brain compared with on the left hand side. So it's suggesting there's much more brain capacity allocated in the average male <coughs> to location and spatial ability than in the average female, which has consequences. Speech. Now look at the top one, ladies. You win hands down in both sides of the brain. We men have kind of not so much. So we're not so interested necessarily in words and so on, perhaps. Might not. Emotion. <laughs> but it shows on the female side a much richer aspect to the way that female, the average female brain fires up in all sorts of different places. And so it's providing a lot of cross connections between different parts of the brain, which means probably greater empathy. Vision. What do you see with that picture? Can you see two pictures? Can you flip it? How many can flip it? How many, many can see, just see the hag? How many can just see the beautiful girl? Can anybody see the beautiful girl other than those who can flip it? A few. <laughs> What do you see there, folks? Yeah, it's a table, isn't it? But at the back of your mind, there's something niggling, isn't there? What's, what's wrong with that picture? There's something subtly wrong. Who would like to volunteer what is actually wrong with that picture? <coughs> yep? Mm. No, it's not to do with the legs. Now, a clue. We are 
we make an assumption that a table has the back and the front leg, um, edges the same length because we rec always recognize tables will be rectangular. Now in a full perspective drawing, that means the back line, the back edge, should be slightly shorter. And those two lines are actually the same length, which makes for an incorrect 3D projection. We made an assumption and glossed over the minor irrelevance that that's a slightly tra trapezoidal table. We made an assumption. Our vision processing saw those, and our brain saw there was something wrong but couldn't be bothered to sort it out because, hey, it's a table and tables are rectangular, so it's just something niggling but I can't be bothered. see there folks? How many can see the white letter, white patches as, as words? Who can't see that those white patches are actually letters? So what is the word? Fly. Fly. Now we get on to some more entertainment. <clears throat> and this is actually getting a little bit closer to home. We've seen how our vision is slightly different from each other, not necessarily male-female. We've seen how spatial perception and positioning is different. Here are something that gets really to the heart, in some respects, of how people think differently, very, very differently at times. Can you all read that or shall I read it out? Okay. On the left, the woman is thinking, he probably doesn't even know I exist. I don't think he'll love me in the long run. He's noticed I've got my mother's thighs. He's just laying there thinking about his future, worrying, wondering, planning, and so on. But all he's doing is looking at that little fly on the ceiling and say, I wonder how flies land upside down. And have you come across that extraordinary difference in how people think? Now, we've just seen something in the press only a couple of days ago, down in London. And some of the top level civil servants are finding out that they have to change very fundamentally the way they behave with our new cabinet and new prime minister. Half, a large proportion of the cabinet is female and the prime minister is female. And they're discovering that they have to change the way they behave in cabinet and in talking to um, Mrs. May. And it's not just because she's the Prime Minister and she's got a whole lot of her um, women in the cabinet. It's about the fact that for many, many years the civil servants have just got used to the sort of way that a male-dominated cabinet works. And they're now having a real wake-up call to understand things a bit like that. That typifies, or over-typifies it in many respects. But it's saying, guys, you've been behaving like boorish guys for so long, you've got to start being respectful. And they will discover that if they do that, not just to the women in the cabinet and the prime minister, but to all the other senior um, politicians, things might actually work more smoothly. So understanding that we don't respond the same to all of, uh, as each other or as me, if I make the assumption you're going to respond the same way as I do, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to really upset a lot of you. Many of you will then stop listening. And that's what's happening in Cabinet at the moment. And they need to go back to understand some of these things. Because it makes such a difference to being successful. Now, have a look at this little uh, picture. And what you can see easily is just how mobile a woman's face typically is. 
And it shows you how the typical man hardly expresses anything. <coughs> now, you probably noticed that I actually am much closer to the top than the bottom. My face is quite expressive most of the time. And so that positions me well across towards the middle and maybe further up to, towards the top. Now, this is interesting and important because, again, if you are the sort of person, whether male or female, who does the top row, you will be looking for those same sort of facial reactions to the situation. Whereas if you're at the bottom, more towards the bottom, you will be expecting no visual response at all. And if you apply those judgments, so if I were looking for those along the top, because that's me, and I see a whole bank of you know, impassive faces, I would assume I'm not communicating, and vice versa. It can cause huge problems and confusion in communicating if we don't understand that there are people at the bottom or people who behave at the top. It may be male, it may be female, or it may not. It doesn't really matter. You've got to judge where they are on that. Now, before we move on, I want you to do a little quiz. I hope if you've got... Um, if you have a pen, it'll be kind of useful. It's called the brain wiring test. And we're having to jump up it because we need to get this done.
may have all four pages printed on one side rather than double sided. <laughs> Now, when you've got the answers to all of the quest 30 questions, A, B, or C, on the, towards the end, on the last page, you'll see how to score it. And there are two different, two scoring mechanisms, one if you're male, one if you're female. And work out what the number is. So you should have finished it now. Have you added up the numbers so you can position yourself on that um, spectrum that I'm showing up there now? Are you all done?
Okay, I'd like you to finish off as quickly as possible because what I'd like to do, for, partly for my own curiosity, is I don't yet know what the, the profile is and it'd be nice if, I could, if you would let me have a stack on here which just has you know, the score on there. If you put your name on it, don't give it to me. But leave it anonymous, then I can produce a little gra graph for next week to show you what the spectrum actually is here. Personal curiosity, and I think it might be interesting for you guys as well. I'm not going to ask anyone to put hands up at all. But what I'm going to say, ask is, as a general question to you, has that given you, or is that, is that profile or your position on there where you thought it would be, or is it different? Now, if it's different from where you thought it would come out, now ask yourselves, what does this mean? Now, let me just give a little example. When I first gave this session and this quest, uh, quiz uh, about five, six years ago, there were two people who I found after the lecture down near my office having a discussion. One was a young lady about this sort of high, and one was a great tall butch guy up here somewhere. And they were discussing their scores, and it turned out that the young lady's score was bang in the 160-ish level, right in the middle. <coughs> And I got there just as they were discussing that. And the guy said to the, the, uh, the late young lady, oh, you're a dyke then. And she got really upset, as you would expect. <laughs> now, so I said, no, that's not right. She has one of the most amazing gifts that anyone can have. Now, what is that gift? Because she was right in the middle, 160. What can she do? with great ease. Yeah, she can understand everybody. The women at the far end, males at the other end. She can be the two-faced person who can understand and communicate that way or that way. It is an astonishing gift if you are up in the middle. It has huge consequences for that young lady's potential career options because it meant that she would be able to communicate incredibly effectively with everybody. Whereas if you are a bloke down at the zero level, <coughs> you are a man from Mars, and you will never understand someone from the ladies from Venus. So if you are in the middle, it has a very important consequence. If you're at the bottom or the top, it has important consequences in types of careers you might choose, in the things that you can do, the ease with which you understand and answer and communicate back to the people around you. So it has huge consequences that you can use to really understand yourself in relation to everybody around you in business, here, as your friends, your colleagues, here at the university, and so on. Yep. Oh. One last little bit to think about. This is set in the context of a man and a woman at home. They're getting up, and different ways that you could ask your partner for breakfast. Is it going to be a, a man who says, go make an omelette for breakfast, or will it be the woman? <laughs> who will say, do you think we should have an omelette for breakfast? Or, wouldn't it be great to have an omelette for breakfast? Or, do you feel like an omelette for breakfast, dear? Now, have you seen those differences? Indirection or direct? <laughs> 
if you're down at minus 40, you will say, go make an omelette for breakfast. If you're round about 50 or 60, you might say, please, will you make an omelette? If you're up in the high, near the 200s or 300s, probably you're going to be the bottom three questions. And notice I did not say if you are a man or a woman, I said if you scored on that profile at a points position up and down the spectrum. Because that's what is important. Not am I male, transgender or female, because people in the middle are not necessarily transgender. But what's important is your score and the consequences on how you communicate and others, oi, and others around you communicate. Okay, that's all we've got time for, given that we had that delay at the beginning. Have a look at the rest of the, um, the presentation. There's only two or three more, but they'll be helpful, interesting to you. Um, the questionnaire is up there in week 10 if you want to use it, if you think it would be interesting with other people around you. Okay, thanks very much, folks. And if you do want to hand it in, down here, please.